Um, I hope you enjoyed the guest lecture. Sorry to have been out for a little bit, but thank you guys for doing it. Uh, I've heard nothing but good things about it, as I knew they would be good. Okay, so today um, we're going to pick up, so sort of where we left off, but also I'm going to follow through. I, uh, both Robin and Greg threw mixed integer optimization at you. And, uh, and so I'm going to do it again, too, uh, because I think uh, we, can, we can sort of resolve one of the major chinks in the armor of our, of our current approach uh, using some of the same tools that you saw in the last two lectures. But more generally, the goal for today is to um, try to take the motion planning algorithms we've been talking about, where trajectory optimization has been our major tool, and resolve, I mean, the big problem with trajectory optimization is that it's local, right? It's a local optimization, right? So what does that mean? That means you might get a local minima in the sense that you might get a solution that has a higher cost than the best solution, right? But worse is the solver sometimes will lie, right? It'll actually say, um, I think the problem is infeasible even if a solution does in fact exist, right? It can get stuck in a minima that makes the solver believe that the problem is infeasible when that's just not the case. And depending on how far you are on your project and if you're using SNAP, you might know Info 13. It comes up, it's, you know, it's really annoying because you don't really know. Is it really infeasible uh, when SNAP says Info 13 or is it, uh, is it just stuck in a local minima? Okay, so what I want to talk about today is a couple approaches to getting to doing motion planning that uh, overcome this, this sort of local implementation idea and give you some more global certificates. And the type, the form of those global certificates might be uh, completeness if you just want to resolve this one. So one goal is completeness. That's a term that comes from the graph search and AI-based planning community, which says that um, the planner will return a solution if it exists. And then optimality, you know. would be ideal to say that I actually found the best possible solution uh, overcoming any local minima. Okay, so lots of ways I thought about organizing the lecture, but roughly I think um, the big idea, the solution idea is to think about how do you combine search with optimization, right? Almost all of the solutions that, that achieve these goals have some, unless the problem is actually convex or you find some way to get it to be convex, but in the, pro, in the case where the problem is more complicated, where, where non-convexity rears its head, um, the solutions roughly fall into the category of combining some, sort of, some form of search with optimization. Some, something like graph search, you know, plus maybe trajectory optimization type things together, okay? Um, 
And I'm going to try to restrict. There's there's a a, a bunch of different ideas that fall under that umbrella, but we're going to restrict ourselves to sort of for continuous domains. And that rules out a bunch. Something that's really natively continuous. Okay? So the real big ideas then are there's sort of two approaches. One is to explicitly decompose the non-convexity into, let's say, convex pieces. Well, I'm a little sleep deprived and jet lagged, so if I write the wrong letter sometimes, you can call me on it. Um, and the second one would be to do uh, a ran some randomized algorithms that are based on sampling, okay? So in terms of maturity of the approaches and applicability, uh, you know, so, so I feel like when you can do this and when it works well, it's the better solution. This is the more popular solution in the literature. If I had my way, I would present this first and then say, ah, but you can, sometimes you can do better and do this. But the problem is there's like an unbounded amount of things to say about this. So I, I, I don't want to like finish lecture and realize I didn't talk about that. So for just logistical reasons, I'm going to go in this order. Um, but when, when, I'm, when we're done, I hope I remind you that I like this one better. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so... Um, Let's start from trajectory optimization and try to make it more global, okay? So remember, there's one place where trajectory optimization already works, is when the problem is, when the trajectory optimization problem is actually convex, right? simplest version of that, if I keep everything in discrete time, is that if I have a linear dynamical system, linear constraints, something like And then I want to minimize some quadratic or linear objective, some convex objective. Then both the direct transcription method and the shooting method end up, that's a convex optimization, right? So that's the case that already has the properties that I wanted. I can call a solver. I can reliably get a solution that returns um, a solution if it exists and only if it exists. I can even, I guess the other implication is so obvious I don't need the, that. And then that solution is guaranteed to be globally optimal. Okay, so when does it break down? It breaks down if I start having either more nonlinear dynamics, that's what we've talked about before, or non, more nonlinear constraints. So let's imagine I had a, an airplane that is somehow regulated so I can, I'm okay thinking about it as a linear system. Okay, and now I want to uh, avoid the obstacles in a polygonal forest, right? That's, that's what motion planning people do. They, they make polygonal obstacles out of everything, so. So what does this look like now? 
Now, polygons are nice because I can represent the, a polygon as, for instance, um, all of the, I can say, p of x less than or equal to um, p0 or something like this. I can describe the interior of a polygon as just a, a set of linear equations, right? So these are half-plane constraints. If I satisfy all of them, I'm in, I'm in the interior. This is a good description of, a, of the obstacle. So is this a convex optimization if I want to um, fly around a polygonal obstacle? Right? This describes the interior. But the obstacle avoidance problem is to not be in the interior. Right, which looks like, okay, maybe you could just say uh, greater than or equal to. It's not that simple, right? This is, you could read this as a, you know, this is a vector constraint, right? And you're saying, I need to be lower than this, and lower than this, and above that, and above that, right? And if I flip the sign, now it becomes an or, right? So the constraint becomes, I'm outside, I'm above this, or I'm about outside this, or I'm about outside this, or I'm about outside that, right? cannot be written as a set of linear constraints. And of course, geometrically, you know that that should be a non-convex constraint because the definition of convexity is if I have two points that are in the, the set, then everything on the line connecting it should be in that set. And this picture clearly shows that that's violated. If this is safe, and this is safe, but this is not safe, then the safe, the feasible set is not convex. Okay, so what do we do about it? Um, how can we take that sort of problem and, uh, and, and throw our optimization at it? Well, much like the hybrid um, optimization world, if we're willing to prescribe you know, that the, the airplane goes around the left side of the obstacle or the right side of the obstacle, then maybe we can make some headway, right? If I were to say, Okay, there's a couple regions here, right? There's this region is, let's say, um, set S1, which is all the ones where this, where I'm outside this face. Maybe there's another region here, okay? If I were to parameterize a trajectory, an a priori say that I want this constraint to be active for these points and this constraint to be active for all of these points and this constraint to be active for all of these points, then you could have a convex optimization. But that's way too much to ask, right? That's like you're giving the solution to the, to the solver. So how can we ask the optimizer to discover that um, that set of, uh, you know, th those assignments. And the answer, yeah. I don't understand why you can't just like take two, define two regions of your, like out just outside of your convex polygon. And then you need to make sure that whatever points you have, it, like, it won't be, I guess it won't be optimal. Yeah, I guess that's the problem. Then you restrict your solutions to, you have to be on that side. It's good. That's exactly the right thought process, right? So um, the problem is if you want to go around an obstacle, right, the, there, there feels like it should just be a choice of left or right, okay? But even on the right side, to write that as a convex constraint, you have to think about this region and then this region as potentially separate regions. Because I could be on, I could be going around that and still, yeah, right. 
So I have to decompose it even further. And it starts getting ugly fast. Okay, so, um, but we can do it. So um, the trick is to let's, let's put mixed integer optimization to task, okay? So we're gonna write this formula, this logical ORs, using mixed integer optimization, okay? So I can write the form, um, if I have for all n, let me call it C0 xn less than D0, or C1 xn less than or equal to D1, okay? But how can I write that as a mixed integer optimization, okay? Let's make a new set of uh, variables. I'll call them bn. And I'll restrict them to be either 0 or 1. Not the range 0, 1. It has to be strictly 0 or 1. It's a binary variable. Okay, now if I write the linear constraint a little differently, if I write two linear constraints, this is my first one, but I'm going to do play a trick here. And I'm going to write, also add this constraint to the solver. Where m here is just a, a large positive constant. This is the affectionately known as big M. That's why I wrote it big, right? See how this works? Let's think it through, okay? So if b equals zero, then effectively I have you know I have my original constraint here. This constraint is sort of, I don't want to say active because I don't know, but it, this is enabled, if you will. It, this constraint is part of the optimization, meaningfully. But this constraint um, sort of disappears because I get, when b equals zero, I get one plus m and, and the boundary of my, uh, of my constraint went up towards infinity, right? So m needs to be large relative to whatever your problem data is. And actually a game when you, play, when you write these optimizations is finding the smallest m which doesn't affect your result but keeps the numerics good, okay? So that's, uh, I don't like big M notation, but that's that's the game we play. So effectively what it does is it sort of says this constraint is active, but you know when B is, when B is uh, whatever makes this, turns this off, it moves that constraint far away. Okay. And then this one is the opposite. Why do you use a big M as opposed to just like multiplying both sides by your integer? Awesome. What's the answer? I mean, do people know? Linear. Right. I want the, the constraint to stay linear in the decision variables. So B is now a decision variable, and X is a decision variable. If I multiplied it, I'd get a multi, you know, they'd, it'd be, it'd be non-convex already. So if you have a good upper bound on X, yes. If you have a good upper bound on X, well, yeah, I mean, you could still pick something even better. So sometimes people do interval arithmetic to, to sort of try to, to find this. Sometimes people solve smaller optimization problems to try to find this because you can be, yeah, I mean, C and D should affect my constraints too. If I only had constraints on, on X, then you can do interval arithmetic, yeah, right. Okay, so, um, 
So if you're willing to allow binary variables, or in general integer variables, if I had um, you know more logical conditions, right? It's almost always binary. Okay, so so people say mixed integer optimization. I have yet to find a satisfying so, uh, algorithm that actually uses the integers more than zero and one. Uh, Okay, so so, but you know, you can make more binaries, uh, um, all right. Then you can turn logical ORs into an optimization. But what does having this constraint do to my optimization problem, right? So my convex optimization. If, if this was convex and this was convex, then I'm feeling pretty good, subject to maybe you know lots of i's plus three equal to zero. What happens if I add one more constraint saying you know uh, x three? Some of my decision variables are binary. This constraint is non-convex. Always, right? So as soon as I have that constraint, I've taken a problem that was nice and convex before, and I've added some non-convex constraint, so I now have a non-convex optimization problem. Why is it non-convex? Well, if zero is feasible and one is feasible, but 0.5 is not feasible, then it's non-convex, right? The good thing about it is that it's a very structured optimization in the sense that I can find solutions, I can, I can guide a search for it using my convex optimization. Okay, so in practice, even though this is non-convex, this is a type of non-convex optimization, which as you saw from Greg and Robin, you can call a solver, and commercial solvers do this very well, and the, the solver will, as long as your problem hasn't become too big, will be complete and optimal, okay? A commercial solver will take this problem description and it will return feasible, it'll return infeasible only if it's infeasible, and it'll return the global optimal solution, right? Often commercial solvers. So typically, you manually choose big M. Sometimes, um, for, you know, for the problems we write, we tend to we try to write some wrappers around it for our domain-specific things, which can set M. So, but that's typically done at an abstraction layer. Um, to solve, or you have to give it a problem that is mixed to integer convex. So you have to give it constraints like this. The transcription from this. To, an op to a mixed integer convex solver is up to the user, typically. You could write a layer which does this by writing it in big M notation, but that's not a standard. Yes? So this correlation seems very general, and for good probably some, for some problems we could think of this form are actually legitimately hard to solve. It. Yes. How do I know that mine's not? Yeah. So this is an NP-hard problem, yes. Um, so it's not that I've turned p equal to np or anything like this. It, within the class of reasonable <laughs> degrees, I get, a, I get an efficient answer, right? It's, it's not a complexity result. I'm just saying a practical result that you can solve. You could solve, you know, pretty fairly big TSPs, and you know, and you can solve fairly big MIQPs. Yes, clearly some of them are clearly too hard to solve. How do I judge mine that I think I have a good chance? Okay, good. So let me let me give you a little bit of uh, intuition about how these things are solving. Uh, 
And the intuition is really a clever combination of search with continuous optimization. And this is in the, the crux of it is just branch and bound. The key idea is if I can, if my problem is minimize f of x subject to um, g i of x plus or equal to zero with some um, x j zero or one, that if I were to take this constraint and just solve a slightly different problem, let's change this constraint to um, and this is clearly not the original problem okay I, but I can relax that constraint these problems are related in an important way right this is strictly easier so the solution to this First of all, had better exist. If there's no solution to this, you know there's no solution to this, right? The solution to this also gives me a lower bound on my total cost, on my ultimate cost, right? So if I get an optimal solution that costs that the, the the optimal cost to go is is 32, right? Then I know if I impose this harder constraint, the cost of executing should only go up, right? And I can solve this problem very fast. Right? Similarly, if I were to um, if I were to just say um, x32 equals one, and then all of my other xj's are like this, if I were to just make an assignment of one of them, right? Then that tells me something about all the solutions that the solver has for which x32 is bound to the variable one. Okay. So it enables a very efficient search where I start guessing the assignments. I mean, you don't even, so there's heuristics for, for guessing the assignment of, to zero or one of, you know, you, there's heuristics on which variable you assign first, you know, based on the solution. For instance, you can imagine if I solve this one and I found out that x32, the optimal solution was 0.98, it might be a good candidate to, well, let's try making it one and see if we solve. But what's important in the branch and bound idea is that solving this problem tells me, gives me a lower bound on every possible solution that has x equal to one. Okay. Similarly, if I have a complete assignment, if I have, if I've solved to optimality anything that has all of the xj's assigned, let me just write. provides an upper bound, okay? So if I found a path for my plane going around the polygonal forest that has cost 45, okay, I know that my optimal solution has to have cost less than or equal to 45. The magic happens is if I, if I assign a few variables, saying go right around the, the obstacle, let's say, and, and without expanding all of these other, without assigning all of these, I know that the lower bound of having gone right is higher than 45, let's say, then I can rule out a huge swath of my search space very, very quickly without ever expanding those nodes. Okay? And that's the crux of the branch and bound algorithm, is you make a decision tree where 
the root is this is this node, this unexpanded, you know, uh, relaxed problem, and you start branching on assignments to the variables, and and doing a very efficient heuristic search down the tree to find a total assignment always keeping track of upper and lower bounds that will converge on the optimal solution. So now, the answer to your so that was all to answer your question. So the, the, um, the answer to your question is it's hard to look at a problem and know um, whether it's going to be good for branch and bound. But I think as you work with it, you, you get there's a sort of intuition. There's a black magic, not, not black magic, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's something about it that you can write problems down in ways that um, that knowing the solution to some integers quickly rules out other integers, which makes your problem very good. Okay, and there's also ways you could write down problems that are where your 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 sort of branching heuristics give you almost no power, and you end up solving the MP hard problem. Small changes in your transcription can have big changes in runtime performance. Yeah, but why? Because it seems like this would be a strict tournament over over. Uh, It's strictly better than checking everybody. Yeah. But checking everybody is a non-starter for most of these problems. The the um, the exponential blow up, the combinatorics are, are are out of this world. But in practice, we can solve. Um, you know, we could solve problems with tens or hundreds of, of binary variables, depending on how they enter, which, you know, two to the hundred is not something you're going to come close to checking every possible solution for. And, and of course, maybe I, also, I always like for you know, my convex solvers the, the plot of like over time and like the convergence of upper and lower bounds. And part of the story, a lot in practice, is that. You can get a very good bound on what the optimal solution would be relatively quickly. And then if you want, you could either wait to, to see the optimal one pop up, or often you can be happy with something that's, you know, in, in a known way, uh, bounded from your optimal system. Yeah, so if... if say the optimal solution happened to be there if you had an oracle telling you what the optimal cost was. One of the features of these solvers is, which is um, what Pete's saying here, is that oftentimes you actually converge fairly quickly. It's never this smooth, but it, it jumps down and it converges fairly quickly to the, in the upper bound. You find, you find the solution, but sometimes it could take a wicked long time to prove that that's the optimal because you have to go through and rule out all of the other cases where, which could have had a cost similar, right? So we end up playing games where, we're, where for instance, if I, got, if I got here, I know my humanoid's not gonna fall down, I'll take it. You know, I, I don't care if it's actually optimal, as long as it's feasible and, and you know, has a reasonable cost or something, I'll go ahead and execute before you wait for this to converge. That is a property of these often. Okay, so that actually is the back end. I wasn't, I wasn't planning to go into it quite that much, but that is sort of the back end of, of why Robin's footstep planner worked uh, well and the back end of Greg's global version of the ICP algorithm, right? And um, we're gonna show you that it's, it works for trajectory optimization too. Okay. It's a very general idea, right? So I just took um, the polygon and said, if you want to be on one side of one face or outside another face, then you could write that as a logical or. But it's much more general than that, right? So you can take basically any nonlinear constraint and make a convex decomposition of it. You know, if I have uh, something that's got that's defined by half planes, but is obviously non-convex, you could imagine making decom convex decompositions of it and making these pieces. Okay, so if I needed to be inside or or outside of this, let's say I wanted to be inside this, 
Right? You can always chop up some nonlinear constraint. The interior of this is g x less than or equal to zero, then I could write it as being in this or this or this or this or this or this. Right? So sort of for arbitrary g of x less than or equal to zero, I can make convex decompositions of it and use these logical ors. The, the cost of the search goes up. The more you, you want to minimize integer variables at all possible cost, but the technique is very general. And even if these things, I, you know, it's, it's easier to think about it as half plane constraints, but you could have a, um, something that's not as easily represented with linear constraints. You could still try to be, make inner approximations or outer approximations of them depending on your level of conservativeness, okay? Um, or you could use other convex geometries inside this. So it's a very general idea, right? Um, <clears throat> what about equality constraints? So what if my dynamics were not um, linear? Right, the, that enters as a as a equality constraint on the dynamics. This is for the inequality constraints. But what if I actually have a um, a constraint which, in my decision variables, you know, this is like x one of x of n x. Sorry, let's say twelve x one thirteen, and I have some nonlinear function. What do you do about that? Hard to make a convex inner approximation of that. Yeah. You like approximate it with piecewise linear bits and parameters? Yeah. So you could certainly do piecewise linear approximations like this. Um, or you can even do envelopes uh, on top of that to, to somehow, if you want to have an outer approximation and you're willing to accept something that's sort of an envelope away from that, then you can do regions that sort of capture the curve. Okay, what does it look like when you're writing out the optimization? So now I would have um, a series of constraints that says that I have x n plus 1 is either, you know, is this or this segment, or it's on this segment, or it's on this segment. And you end up with the integer variables to, to make that decision. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the algorithm way to either optimally or non optimally take a non convex space and then separate it out into convex space? They are not good. Um, so the answer is how do you take this picture and make an optimal um, convex decomposition? Uh, they're, they're as expensive as, the, the, finding the optimal decomposition is also, I believe, NP hard. I'm, yeah, I don't have the proof in my head, but I'm confident that that's the case. Um, so people do approximations of them. I'll show you one in particular that worked well for us. I'll show you graphically, at least. Uh, in terms of the solvers, since we've seen that other kinds of solvers can solve those nonlinear constraints between, like, the, you can do a dynamic model that has nonlinear dynamics uh, without doing the piecewise linear approximation. So, how does the problem complexity compare between using the nonlinear solver versus doing this? It's the the complexity is worse here, but you're guaranteed to get an answer. So if it's the difference between, uh, you know, Atlas is running, and the solver might just get stuck and confused and give me no answer, uh, you know, versus I have one that takes twice as long to run, but it'll always give me an answer. I will probably just for reliability choose the more the. Is it guaranteed to give you that answer in a certain amount of time? It seems like this could also take a long time. Right. No, so that's where you start playing games about about this. Um, it's true. It could go and and take uh, too long. It's true. I don't. I mean, in practice, we always try to guard against that, of course. But there's no strict guarantees. So you showed us examples where you use the mixed integers in constraints. Do you use them in your graphic function ever? Is that you, you can do that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so, so objective functions and constraints can flip back and forth very easily if you were to just uh, the, sort of the easiest way to see what you what you asked would be to say write this problem lambda is greater than or equal to f of x and then g of i of x is equal to zero and you push down on that so you can play all the same tricks this would be a slack variable good questions awesome okay so um, let me give you some examples here. So, uh, for instance, one of the nonlinear dynamics that comes up in when you're planning legs or or manipulation uh, motions is basically rotations always come in and get you. Rotations are almost always um, can introduce some sort of non-convexity. In the particular case of trying to care about, if you wanted to generalize Robin's footstep planner to the case of dynamics, so you don't have to have your center of mass staying level the whole time, then you pick up these cross product terms, right? So the forces, the relationship between the force and the, and the motion of the center of mass, once the center of mass can go up and down, has a cross product in it. Okay? So here's the picture. Here's the picture that was up a minute ago. There it is. Okay, good. All right, so that's what the constraint looks like. It's just a bilinear, any bilinear constraint happens to be in the zero to one region, right? That's what a bilinear constraint looks like, and it's non-convex. So in the particular version I'll show you here, <clears throat> you can do things like putting a linear envelope around it, and that's often called a McCormick envelope in operations research. And that's very conservative, right? In this case, it says, I'm gonna, I wanna find a solution for which the ground reaction forces make my center of mass do the right thing, but I could have, uh, I could have mismatch between my, my center of mass dynamics and my ground reaction forces up to that defect. So it allows aphysical trajectories to come out. But you can make them sort of arbitrarily tight by just carving that up into smaller pieces. Right? It adds more energy variables, gets more expensive. Okay, so here's how that looks for a running robot. Or this is a little dog with its legs cut off and put it in prismatic uh, legs instead, okay? But we wanted the little dog to bound, okay? And the full model was, ex was very expensive, but the centroidal dynamics were pretty reasonable. And so there's integer variables indicating if the leg was on, in, or in contact with each of the, um, of the steps. But then since it had an aerial phase, there's also free space regions, okay? So basically, the, um, there's an integer indicating whether each foot is in, on the box or in the air or in the air or on the box or in the air or on the box. Yes? By the way, you know, the contact constraints are, are also supernaturally encoded as this, right? So the... Um, Remember our friends, the complementarity constraints, which was, I said the distance between, you know, the distance of my foot to the ground had to be greater than or equal to zero, or lambda had to be greater than or equal to zero, the normal force. Okay, so this one actually just wants to be an or, and you can write it exactly the same way. All right, so you can use the same integer variables to, to regulate your contact forces with your distance to the ground. Okay, so you decompose this manually in this case, decompose the space. The assignment to regions provides convex constraints for position and force now. And then you can ask the solver and it finds solutions like this. Now the experience, this was a number of years ago we did this, this is Andres Valenzuela's uh, PhD thesis. 
and the experience at that time was, was uh, okay, the solver's a little bit slower, but oh my gosh, it's so much nicer to work with a solver that doesn't lie to you. That when it says infeasible, it's actually, you've, you've written an infeasible problem. Um, and and uh, it's just a completely different experience than trajectory optimization where Snopped returns 13 and you're like, okay, well, are my constraints bad? Do I have to try a different initial guess, right? It's a more conservative approach, but if it scales to the harder problems, then it works, okay? Now, we didn't solve the problem with the mixed integer optimization for the entire detailed leg of the robot, okay? But you can basically take that solver, that solution, and then do the full trajectory optimization with Snopped, given that as an initial guess on the full dynamic model of the robot. And then that also closes the gap of the McCormick envelope. It could fail. That step could fail. There's no guarantees because the McCormick envelope was an outer approximation. The, the straight leg was an outer approximation. Okay, but in practice, this is the most robust sort of solution we have for planning systems of this complexity. Okay, so what are the pitfalls of that kind of thing? I'm going to stop that, otherwise you won't pay attention to me. Um, yeah? Is that or or an exclusive or? So like, yeah. You're, you're right. In this case, it has to be an exclusive or. Okay. In the particular case of complementarity constraints, right? Okay, but with the mixed integers or with the so you can you can do the same assign you can you can play the big M notation and get XOR. Thank you for clearing for, for catching me on that. But the bit you I think you you'll see with the same exercise of big M notation you can make XOR work too. Good catch. Okay, so um, the pitfalls are that the, it scales, you know, this, it, it is doing uh, a, a worst case combinatorial search over the integer variables. So it scales badly with the binary variables. There, that means in the case of having complicated obstacle geometry or something like this, it makes a big difference how do you um, decompose, you know, the, the question you asked is, is on point. Um, you know, it makes a big difference how efficiently you can decompose. I'm gonna skip, since I don't have time, I'm gonna skip the decomposition algorithm but uh, good decomposition algorithms exist, okay? Um, the other thing I really don't like about this, so, so I really think, I think there is some combinatorial search required to solve these sort of problems. If you really have to decide, am I gonna go left around the tree or right around the tree, some combinatorics feel inevitable, and I'm okay that the problem that we're writing down is combinatorial. I think that is, that is the truth. But there's also some false combinatorics hidden hidden in this. I, the way I've written it down here, which is this, the best way we know how to write it down, really, makes it more combinatorially complex than it needs to be, than it should be, right? So if I have my airplane flying through the forest, you know, it feels like. There's sort of, you know, only a handful of choices, right? I, if I commit to going, you know, there, there's a combinatorial choice about, you know, am I going this way, this way, this way, or this way? But the combinatorics I have here are I have to decide for every, for every knot in my trajectory optimization, I am independently deciding whether it's on this side of the constraint or this side of the constraint or this side of the constraint, okay? So I'm writing down a problem with way more integer variables than I think I should have, have to have, and relying on branch and bound to be clever that if once it's made an assignment here, then it's able to quickly rule out that, you know, it'll quickly say that, well, this one can't be over here. You know, the, the neighboring points can't be over here. In track, I, I think there would be a nice, uh, in, you know, a breakthrough could occur if we could write those problems down without that false combinatorics. Because I, I think the solver does a pretty good job of that, but not, I mean, it could so dramatically slow down our solution. But given that, the approach is really pretty general. So, um, you know, I showed you a quadruped there. Here's a UAV flying through clutter. There's an extra trick here, which makes the quadrotor dynamics, but you don't have to do a mechanical envelope. You can actually, if you, if you have unlimited uh, propeller power, which most quadrotors do effectively, you can, um, 
it's, it's, it's morally similar to feedback linearization. Uh, but it's called differential flatness. You can exploit differential flatness of the quad rotor to basically plan the trajectories and have the quad rotor follow the trajectory. Okay, so it decomposes the space into these convex approximations and then solves an MIQP on the fly to, not on the fly, it solves an MIQP and then flies. <laughs> Is that decomposition done automatically? This one is done automatically, and it's an it's an inner approximation of the free space. Right, and that's that's an algorithm that I was going to talk about more, but I won't. And then it flies. And then we tried to make a, a Mission Impossible video, but that's red string. So I don't know if it's as cool as Mission Impossible, but um, yeah, it flies pretty well. Okay, and it can work for manipulation too, right? So you can you can decompose objects that you want to grab into different faces, and in practice, that's how we do things like grasp optimization, um, which we might get you on the next problem set. Okay. So that's the decompose the world into pieces and then throw our optimization hammer at it. But try to be clever about the way we transcribe these problems so that the, the search as an outer layer to the optimization can, can quickly navigate the problem, right? The difference between a mixed integer convex problem and a mixed integer non-convex problem is dramatic. The, the ability to use this, these uppers and, and lower bounds by solving optimiza convex optimization problems makes a huge difference in the, in the performance of these algorithms. Okay? Even the, the best mixed integer nonlinear programming solvers make iterative convex approximations as they go. They just add more integer variables to, to slice it up. Okay. The other approach that I want to tell you about is uh, is more search, less optimization, uh, but it's it's a tool you should have in your toolkit. And that's this randomized motion planning world. Okay, so um, think about how to transition here. So, so um, we did ex a somewhat exhaustive labeling of the uh, of the free space. In the, in the last approach and decomposed it explicitly. It turns out you can do pretty well and sometimes in surprisingly large problems if you ignore all that and you just do random sampling, okay? And this is one of those th algorithms that is incredibly satisfying because you can type it in in a few lines and get impressive results. The analysis uh, is weak but easy to do. Um, and in practice, it, it, it can solve um, it can solve some pretty big problems, okay? The canonical problem is the bug trap. Where it's a motion planning problem where you've put your friendly wheeled robot inside a place that sort of was easy to get into but hard to get out of. So you got a, my wheeled robot inside here. Okay, and a goal outside here. How do I find a plan? I do trajectory optimization and it's here. You're, very, you're gonna have to get very lucky for the trajectory optimization to find its way here and get all the way outside, okay? So um, it turns out that there's some pretty simple algorithms that solve this pretty well. And I think the best way to, to illustrate that is just to run a few of them first, okay? So, in fact, here's the, the bug trap right away. Okay, so my initial condition was somewhere in here. My goal is outside here. And I'm gonna start looking for trajectories that, that get me out of that into the goal. The way I'm gonna do it is by randomly searching over the space. 
okay? But with a bias towards exploration, so that eventually my random samples help me to get outside this sort of bug trap and, and eventually find a path to the goal, okay? Random algorithm, cute in two dimensions. This is sort of the hardest case for that algorithm still. Um, and it works actually surprisingly well in high dimensions. The first, um, I'll, I'll show you in a second, okay? There are a handful of randomized motion planning algorithms out there that are very popular, and there's lots and lots and lots of work about this. That's why I said the presentation of it could be unbounded. I think many of you know these algorithms well, um, and if, if you haven't seen them, then I hope to give them to you, but uh, um, in particular, I'll show you the, the, the tricks required to make them work for under-actuated systems. Okay, so the, the first algorithm we'll talk about here is the RRT. And it's sort of incredibly simple. So if I start off with an initial configuration, and I have a goal configuration over here. Then the way I'm gonna find a solution, and <clears throat> let's first ignore the dynamic constraints. Let's just find any path, a geometric planning problem, okay? This is sometimes called kinematic. Kinematic motion planning. The notable difference is I'm allowed to move in any direction at any time in configuration space, okay? And the idea is really simple, okay? The idea is pick up a sample at random, find the closest point on my, on my current tree, which started off as a, as a single node, and try to extend the tree towards the random sample, okay? On the next iteration, I'll pick a new random sample, I'll pick the closest point on the tree, I'll grow it towards that random sample. I'll pick a new one, pick a random sample, grow it towards the sample. If I have a, you know, a maximum amount I can grow at certain, you know, at, at each iteration, I will go get all the way there. Okay, pick a random point, whichever one happens to be the closest, I'll extend it, and you grow up this, this tree, and, uh, and eventually, maybe with some probability, you pick the goal as your sample, eventually you'll find a path that will get me all the way to the goal. Okay, that's the RRT algorithm, right? So. some magical properties, like that bug trap uh, animation suggested, okay? It tends to be to rapidly explore space. So let's contrast this with a different algorithm, which sounds very similar, but it's gonna behave very differently. Let's say you start with your random, uh, your initial sample. You pick a random action, a random direction, and you grow in that direction, okay? Now I pick another, pick, pick a sample at random, Pick a random direction and grow in that direction, okay? If you do that, you'll get a lot of samples that are all uh, clustered around your initial point, but it does a very bad job of, of expand, expanding to fill the space, okay? This is a magical, sort of simple um, algorithm for pulling the, the, the tree out into space by setting these random sub goals, okay? It gets more interesting if I have obstacles. I'm still gonna pick a random sample. This time, if my sample... is in collision, then just continue, then... Uh, to one, okay? 
So if I pick a sample that's inside my um, inside an obstacle, I'm just going to throw it away. Rejection sampling to be able to in order to sample from this free space. So unlike the other algorithm, this algorithm does not need to make any explicit decompositions of the space. All it needs is a Boolean collision detection algorithm. Okay, and it works shockingly well. The analysis is nice. Um, it it goes through. Uh, you know, the algorithm has something called a Voronoi bias. Okay. So, I think I could show it better with a movie. Okay, so here's that same algorithm. But now I'm also drawing the Voronoid regions of the graph as it goes. So the Voronoi region is the region, so this Voronoi region is the set of, um, sp the space for which that point is the closest point in the tree. That's the definition of the, that's a, a Voronoi decomposition, just carves up the space based on the distance to the closest point, right? So every point has a region associated with it, which is all the region for which it is the closest point. Okay, now let's watch that again. So the Voronoi bias of the RRT is sort of this magical thing which says, if I just sample uniformly inside the, the state space, then the chances of, of entering one of the regions is proportional to the, the size of that region, okay? Which means the probability of expanding from the node is, is proportional to the volume of its Voronoi region. Okay? is you get that property without ever making the Voronoi diagram, right? So it was annoying to make this video because I had to, to do the Voronoi decomposition all the time. It was trivial to write the algorithm. I just pick a point at random and find the nearest point and expand, okay? But it has this great property, not so... The, the, the tendency of the algorithm, because of this Voronoi bias, is to reach out and sort of fill the space to begin with. It'll fill in the big Voronoi regions at the outside. And then, as it's populated the space, it'll go in and now the bigger Voronoi regions are the regions that are in the interior, and it starts filling in the nooks and crannies. Okay, and that's how it's able to eventually solve the, the bug trap problem. Okay. So what, what can we say about the completeness of the algorithm? It's fairly weak. It says as the number of samples goes to infinity, it will eventually find a solution if it exists. That's a notion of probabilistic completeness. That sounds awesome and powerful, but actually the stupid algorithm that doesn't actually work has, is also probabilistically complete. Yeah? What about the other side of completeness, right? This is going to tell you no such thing exists. Correct. Right, so, so that's right. You, you, you never know that the problem's infeasible. You have to keep sampling. How would you get it to, in practice, how would you get it to feel gracefully if you're not sure if there's a person or not? In practice, people set a max number of iterations based on their patience. <laughs> and uh, and if it doesn't terminate, you say that problem was pretty hard. Can you guarantee that it takes the goal of that number of iterations? No. No, you don't have those guarantees. But there's loads of papers and heuristics about how to make these things, um, the heuristics better for these things. Okay? Yeah. I'm trying to understand where this power is coming from. One hypothesis I have for that is perhaps the magic here is really in how you put distance to distance. 
if you think, if I already knew how long it takes to get from point to the goal, I would have solved the problem already. And this algorithm, in some sense, per se, having a good estimate on that. Awesome. So, um, well, so, so let me say that, say that back. So why does this work well? Uh, in, in, you, in kinematic motion planning problems, uh, the idea of picking a random point and finding the closest distance is a good heuristic for search. That distance, the distance metric, the trivial Euclidean distance metric is a pretty good heuristic for search. What we're going to find is if you have dynamic constraints, if you try to do this now for, let's say, the pendulum, then the distance metric, the standard Euclidean distance metric is not a good distance metric, and the algorithm on its first attempt kind of falls on its face. Okay, so we, so when one way to do it is by repairing it by coming up with a better distance metric. So I would say that the, the cleverness here is that for geometric planning problems, which can be thought of as a point moving through a Euclidean space, the Euclidean metric is a good heuristic for search. And it's the same reason why A star search on a graph, if you're calling Google Maps or whatever, has good strong heuristics. This one, compared to the graph-based, is more natively continuous. It has this, you know, it will draw samples as long as it needs to to finally solve the problem. Uh, but is there an obstacle between the new point and the closest point? Yeah, so uh, people have, you know, so the best you can do is subsample. Well, sorry, that's not true. I mean, you can do collision detection of the link. You know, if, you, if you're careful, what you would do is do collision detection between a line segment and the region. People often don't. They do if you if you only have access to a point-based collision detection algorithm, then you will su you will subsample along the path and, and hope that you're sampled finely enough. And uh, what what do you do if you find the collision? You just discard this one. Just discard. Yep. Yeah. The the philosophy is that your goal is to sample from the um, the free space. And you can do that by uh, by rejection sampling, and I so and the point you're you're pointing here is if I if I tried to extend here and I got a line like this, I would just reject it too. And in the same spirit, that's that's a sort of a rejection sampling approach to sampling from the feasible solutions. Okay, so let me show you what it looks like for. Well, so first of all, people, you know, when this came out, um, James Kuffner, for instance, was showing it working on like a humanoid. Uh, which is awesome, right? So um, this was a kinematic trajectory plan, assuming just because thinking of the configurations of the robot, with a constraint which said that my center mass was always inside my support polygon, and then the velocities were sped up until the, to make sure that the Z and P stayed inside the support polygon. Now you, you guys know what Z and P is from Robin's lecture, right? So um, and Tuan's part of the lecture. So. Uh, that's awesome. This is not directly out of the RRT, though. Uh, this is uh, smooth after the uh, coming out of the RRT. There's um, there's the RRT dance. That, so so some people call RRTs and then put it directly on the robot, and the result is the robot. You know, if he goes to pick up the paper, goes like this. <laughs> you know, that's how you know if you're using an RRT, right? There's actually um, if you watch. Chimp getting into the car in the DRC. It's possibly one of the coolest uh, robot actions I've ever seen. Like it looks like Transformers, and he's got this continuously rotary joints. And I don't actually think they used an RRT to do it, but it looks like it's doing the RRT dance, right? Did they, do you know if they did the RRT for them? Yes, the RRT. I, I thought it was a um, uh, search by uh, undergraduate researcher was what I what I understood it that day, but <laughs> but. Um, but there are some, if you look for it, you will see robots doing ridiculous things, and it's because they called an RRT and didn't, didn't smooth the trajectory afterwards. So um, what I would advocate instead is that you think of all these tools. I said the topic of today is to how do you combine search with optimization. The trivial way to combine this with optimization is to do your randomized search to find an initial feasible trajectory, and then do trajectory optimization to come up with a good, use that as an initial seed to trajectory optimization. One of the things I like a lot about this formulation of, of trajectory search is that I don't have to say a priori how many points are in my, my optimal solution. That is something that is, I have, I've always considered gross in trajectory optimization is that you, either, you have to stop your optimizer 
write, put more breakpoints in, resolve it again, or something like that. It's it's unnatural, but uh, a consequence of having a fixed number of decision variables that we have a, a fixed parameterization of our trajectory. It's nice in this more uh, simple algorithm that you don't have some fixed parameterization of the trajectory. Once you're done, you've got what, a path to the goal, which has you know whatever number of samples it has, and you can start a trajectory optimization from that. And I think that works pretty well. There's loads of tricks about how do you do bi-directional search. You can make these things faster if you start one tree from the goal, one tree from the initial condition, and just try to find places where they meet. Um, there's ways to try to put optimality back into these algorithms. RRT star was uh, sort of invented here with Sertosh and, and Emilio um, on a way to put effectively put optimization back in where you um, you drop edges when you find a new candidate that is, that is a better um, edge. But a lot of these things fall on their face once you, sh once you actually put them into systems with dynamics. So the classical problem is, um, is even just trying to solve the pendulum. Okay, so here's my old simple implementation of the very basic algorithm for the RRT, just like I showed you before. It comes up and fills the space. Now I'm going to do the same thing, but, but now I'm going to pick a point at random. I'm going to find the closest point on the graph. And I'm going to try to do um, an action that I think will go as close as possible to the next point, but it's subjected to the constraints of the pendulum dynamics, right? Because I'd like to find a path for the pendulum to swing up to the goal. Let's see how that works. Okay, so it starts. Oh, that was that was way lucky. <laughs> My whole point was that it's not going to do that. Okay. Right, so it, it does somewhat exhaustive evaluation sometimes of the of the search tree, right? Expanding lots and lots of possible feasible nodes, just trying to pass, pass to the goal. Hey, I found one, right? But um, but that first one was I've never seen it that. <laughs> Okay, so it can solve swing up problems for the pendulum, but it's not graceful in doing so. Okay, if you had a pendulum with obstacles or something like that, this could still solve it if it's you know probably in a probabilistically complete sense, but it doesn't feel good yet because there's three basic steps of the algorithm, right? So I pick my random sample. Finding the closest point in the current tree suddenly has a lot of problems if you have dynamics, right? Why? Well. The standard Euclidean distance metric is not a good choice for dynamical systems, right? Say I've started at the, at the bottom. I've got a beautiful trajectory like this. And my goal over here, okay, of the pendulum now. Let's say I pick a sample right here, a random sample. Which node should I expand? All right. The closest point here, in a Euclidean sense, is going to end up at best going over here. Okay, so as soon as I have a dynamic constraint, my Voronoi bias is lost. It's no longer going to um, expand into the region that had large volume. Okay, in practice, I should have tried to expand from a node here if I wanted to go towards that. Okay, so the notion of a distance metric is sort of broken. address this. I mean, so, so the reason that's a problem is that you end up expanding and expanding nodes that will, um, I mean, a, a worse problem would be, let's say, my airplane, which has some forward dynamics. Okay, so, and there's an obstacle over here, and there's trajectories 
that I, let's say I'm sampling here, I'm trying to get the system to go around the trajectory, but because it's picking this node, it's just slamming into the wall constantly, right? So the only nodes it tries to expand are the ones that are slamming into the wall. And it's very, very inefficient. It would eat, the only way to eventually get around the wall is to sample over here, then sample over here, then sample over here, and have enough samples that it overcomes the, the bad uh, distance metric, okay? Um, you could also get around this with better sampling. So people have done for, for, for dynamic, um, so they did, people call, call it kinodynamic planning. You can basically take any one of these steps and try to make them better for, um, for dynamics. So you can, the most natural one, I think, is to try to come up with um, a better distance metrics for the, the closest point search. And there's ideas about that. So um, you know, in the past, we've had a problem set problem, which I don't think we'll have this time, but um, uh, of trying to use some of our notions of the homoclinic orbit on the pendulum to use as an energy metric, as a distance metric. But you can embed some of your physical intuition about the problem. You can also solve small LQR problems to come up with local estimates of a distance metric. Um, there's a great paper by Emilio Frizzoli uh, that, that does planning of a helicopter through obstacle um, with an RRT. The trick he used was he solved value iteration for the helicopter, brute force, in the unconstrained case. And then when the constraints came, when, when the obstacles appeared, he had to do random sampling to find his way through the obstacles, but the solution of the dynamic, the cost to go from the, the value iteration solution gave him a distance metric to use for the randomized algorithm on the fly. Okay, so there's lots of ideas that, makes, that you can make your distance metric better. You can make your sampling distribution better if you can, if you can sort of pick samples that are places where you know the dynamical system can grow. And you can also extend better. People do things like trying to do trajectory optimization for every little extension operator, and that can be a lot better too. So because I knew I wouldn't have time for it, I just prepared a few highlights. So, um, so this is a reachability guided RRT, okay, where it, it keeps a local approximation of the reachable region in the vicinity of the tree. As it grows, it tries to keep a sort of shadow of what are possible points it could, um, it could grow towards, and it samples from that. And the result is that, you know, for the pendulum swing up, it gets these much sparser trees and it solves much, much, much faster, okay? Uh, the intuition there is that it's keeping this, this sort of moving Voronoi region constraint. So, so it's only gonna sample from the green regions, which are the regions it knows will pull the tree out into new, newly explored, unexplored space. So think of it as a, a sort of an adaptive Voronoi bias. And that was enough to make Little Dog find dynamic plans over rough terrain back in the day. Okay. Um, I think Emilio's work stands out as a, the, the, using the, the value iteration to solve the dynamic trajectories of the, quad, of the helicopter stands out as one of the best. And in practice, people have a handful of really good heuristics for kinodynamic planning. But very little theory. Basically, um, even the notion of completeness disappears. Certainly the Voronoi bias analysis disappears. So, you know, this has become kind of a mess of, of random ideas put together in the literature. There's, there's hundreds of papers uh, that are various combinations of distance metrics, random sampling type ideas, and there's not one coherent story to tell you, to send you home with. I was saying this is the way you, you should do it. In practice, your mileage may vary. Which brings me back to the initial 
um, statement about the whole lecture was that I think these algorithms do scale to tens, hundreds of dimensions beyond reason, really. Um, certainly in the kinematic case, sometimes in the kinodynamic case. But you, you have very few guarantees about whether they actually succeed. My preference when they work, when they scale, um, is that I think the mixed integer type optimization uh, can do a more structured search through the through, through the same kind of problem space and give you some guarantees about whether it's going to succeed or not. Okay, but those two tools together, I think, fill out your toolbox on the ability to find solutions if they exist and then optimize them. In, in, this, in a post-processing case on the RRT, you could then seed your trajectory optimization and, and have a pretty good system. On Thursday, we'll try, try to tell you how to do more global feedback policies by putting a lot of these things together. And then we'll get into stochastic stuff next week. Thanks very much. Thank you.